Welcome back to Fort Moore and the T-28 Super Heavy Tank. To our roof. Well, actually, I'll start off with the turtle back. I know people call it a doom turtle. I guess it makes some sense, but uh, so does the design. So the engine only takes up a portion of the very large engine deck. Uh, there's also some very large coolers because this engine and transmission is straining. It takes a lot of cooling to do it. So you have a very large engine deck with slopes backwards, simply because it doesn't need to be horizontal all the way back. And then you get to the large flat roof. I was going to say turret roof, but of course it's not a turret. On the plus side, look at all the sleeping space. This is great. Four-man crew, so lots of room. There are a couple of catches. So, for example, there is a thin hatch, for lack of a better term, covering where the gunner's primary sight ordinarily would go. Or periscopic sight, at least. We do still have, though, the driver's hatch, the commander's hatch, the blower on the left rear, the fuel tank filler, it looks like, at the front, either that or that's coolant. Could be both. I'd have to lift it up and I suspect it hasn't been opened in many, many, many years. Uh, and of course, the ring mount for the caliber 50 heavy machine gun. Because heaven forbid this thing should find itself on its own as the centerpiece of a breakthrough piece that it doesn't have some accompanying anti-aircraft equipment or uh, anything to deal with infantry that may show up. Yeah, got to have a caliber 50 of your own. The Caliber 50 is the only machine gun on the tank. There is no coaxial machine gun as you might ordinarily expect. But hey, after all, it is uh, the role of the vehicle. You're probably not going to be on your own. And there are the small arms, uh, 0.45 for these submachine guns. Right, so that's it. Now uh, for the outside. Now we'll take you inside the T28. Right, TC's position, and it's probably the least comfortable of all of them. Uh, no scratch that because I'm just quickly looking at where the loader is. So he's not the least comfortable. Now, that's the odd thing about this is that there's a lot of cubic space inside this vehicle, but it's all taken up by things except the crew. So especially when you consider the, the size of the 105 ammo. Now, he's got 660 rounds of caliber 50 to store around here in as well somewhere. But you can imagine, as he is progressing towards the pillbox, or whatever it is that uh, has basically been designated for destruction, uh, he's going to be trundling on and everybody and their uncle is going to be shooting at him. So for a change, he's probably not going to be driving head out as a TC. So he does have what appears to be basically a vision cupola, so he's got six periscopes around him for 360, and he has a rotating and adjustable and elevation periscope right in the middle, which would be his primary way of looking around. To his rear, the radios would be mounted uh, on the center rear, and you can also see the fuel canisters. Now, there are little flaps here, which can open or close, depending if you want to draw the air from the crew compartment or from the engine deck. Now, ordinarily, you want to go with the engine deck, uh, not least also if it's winter, you don't want to have the, the rush of air coming through here as the big v uh, engine is sucking in uh, air for combustion but it is an option if it's a really really hot or b if the fumes from the firing in the cannon are such that the blower can't keep up now there is a blower or at least it would be it's mounted up in the top left it's actually designed to have a slight overpressure to keep the gases out of the compartment instead of allowing it to come back in. Now, this is not an overpressure in the more modern NBC sense of the word. There is no NBC filter as part of the system. It's merely an overpressure. And so that's pretty much it. I mean, you would otherwise have his regular selection of uh, radio communications and uh, a spot here for his map. Uh, but uh, a lot of other uh, ammunition is going to go here, projectiles, and I presume the propellants may go down here. I'm not entirely sure. But judging by the way these racks are, and they fold down, that's my guess, because this is a two-piece ammunition. The gunner had to be a midget. 
Uh, so I I have no idea how we were supposed to fit. Now there's, I obviously am sitting at 90 degrees, but there are at least two indicators that he should be facing forwards. Firstly, there is a backrest, and secondly, there is a foot pedal down on the bottom right, or a foot trigger, more accurately. You put stomp down, and 105 millimeter goes boom. The control the gun has got a simple screwdriver. You can see it's come off here. So as you crank, a gear will rotate this, which is basically the screw, and it will elevate and depress your 105. Max elevation is about 18 degrees. Max depression is four. Uh, for Traverse, same idea. It's a screw Traverse. You got 13 degrees going to the left, 11 degrees going to the right. You can see why the issue is on the, on the loader side in a moment. Two sights. He'll have the periscopic sight to his front. It's either an M10E3 or a T140. Uh, the 141. And this was not a well-regarded uh, setup because the linkage from here to the gun was loose and considered inaccurate. But there was a backup. The T140 will be located uh, on the right-hand side. It's a coaxial telescope, a by 3 and that went all the way through. Now the 105 was the T5E1. Carried a nice range of ammunition, AP, HE, or APD, uh, correction, HVAP. Uh, the AP round would fire off at about 2700 feet per second. And uh, the HVAP was at 35. Now after the war, there were trials to increase the pressure of the gun. They got to the point that the AP round hit about 3200 FPS and HVAP was in excess of uh, 47. To the point that the thing would punch through 5 inches of armor at uh, sloped armor, I should add, at uh, 2000 yards. And I'm completely making that up. So don't take that in my word for it. In fact, better yet, you're probably better off looking it up yourself. It's the AP 182. Okay, fine, I'll look it up for you. Turns out I was close enough. It is indeed five inches of sloped armor, 55 degrees, uh, at about 2,000 yards. There you go. It was quite a good gun. Remember, this thing wasn't really designed to go up against tanks anyway, so five inches of armor is one thing. This thing was designed to eliminate bunkers. When well, you're talking about a couple of foot of concrete. And even today, it is pretty typical you crack a bunker open first using a sabo or basically armor piercing and then you'll pump a couple of high explosive or heat whatever into it now of course uh, eventually you end up putting this gun onto t29 but that is another story for another day suffice to say this gun would make problems go away now, just while I'm sitting here, a quick note on the condition of the vehicle. Now, remember, this vehicle was lost. However, you lose a 95-ton, one-of-a-time, quad-track vehicle for 27 years. And if you see photos of it, it's like spawning mechanics that were kind of tiny with the bush. Uh, and after they found it, they put it on open display in the outdoors at Fort Knox for another couple of decades. So ordinarily, you would expect a vehicle that has had that sort of treatment to be in pretty battered shape. And, okay, yeah, they're giving it a sandblast and a respray, but it still has most of the stowage and it's in pretty good condition. But obviously it hasn't come out entirely unscathed. For we can see that the elevation handle has come off. But it does also show us very clearly how it works. So inside you can see a bevel gear, which is still actually very nicely greased. And uh, it meshes in with the gear ring here which is directly attached to the spiral screw which then goes up and down with your elevation so uh, there you go that's how that works the loader didn't have a great seat at all and remember i'm not sitting here with all the ammunition that is supposed to be stowed now officially there is spots for 62 rounds of ammunition although in practice they could only actually get 58 to fit uh, there were a couple of interferences here or there that uh, some of the slots seemed to be weren't usable. But uh, again, the one saving grace, this is not a vehicle that you're supposed to sit in for hours at a time, careening across in exploitation or uh, waiting for the enemy to attack. This is, you get in, you drive to where it is, that you need to blow something up, you blow it up and then you get out. So I, I guess I can give it that. Uh, the guard is huge, it's made even thicker by... Uh, ballast to 
counterbalance the weight of the gun at the front, too, because otherwise the gunner will be unable to actually elevate and depress the gun. Uh, the gun itself, looking at the breech vertically sliding breech block, the breech opening handle is on the wrong side. Uh, so is the cocking handle. Now look at it. If you have to refire, you, you pull the cocking handle to try again, percussion primer. Again, separate loading of projectile and pellet. And one of the problems that he had was if the gunner had to traverse right, well, he's already the loader who is trying to manipulate these reasonably sized rounds uh, into the breach. He's already up against the, the back wall here. If the gun traverses to the right, the aft end of it is going to come left into the guard. The test report notes that if the gunner is traversed to the right, the loader needs to work his way around to the other side and then load from the far side of the gun, which at least on the plus side, I can see you got stowage on the far side for propellant and projectile as well. So not the greatest. Uh, the blower, as I say, will come up here. There's uh, the master power switches are here together with even the same. So if, if you're, if you need to jump start your T28, you can jump start your T28. I don't recall seeing anything in the manual about a, a uh, push start. Uh, Good luck, maybe if you're going downhill. Last thing I'll say, as a firewall on the right, I've already mentioned the air filters. Uh, there is an access port you could, in theory, get the part of the V8 engines. Uh, both easily enough found here. Well, let's see what happens if I do this. The window, see if the hinge snaps or something. Stowage. Nothing to do with the engine at all, it's just stowage. Right. Uh, wires, of course, going all over for the electrical system. Uh, no stabilizer on this tank. Uh, but there are some dome lights. I see one has survived, it looks like, over... Oh, no, there's a dome light here has also survived. Uh, selectable, so you got white light, or you have whatever the color was that they chose for night vision. Uh, World War II, I couldn't recall off the top of my head. And, uh, that brings us to the driver. When you get to the driver's seat, I think you actually found a comfortable one. Uh, I fit them quite nicely, actually. The, the seat is adjustable in elevation, at least it would ordinarily be. Uh, controls are a little bit complicated compared to other vehicles of time, such as the Pershing, of which uh, the transmission is, of course, based. So there is the selector uh, for the automatic transmission, or hydromatic, on the left-hand side. So it's got uh, two ranges, low range, uh, which is basically just first, first and second, and then one to three. Uh, ordinarily, you just set it in third and forget it. Uh, I mean, the, the instructions give, uh, for really bad terrain, go with one. I mean, you probably must really mess it up if you're, if you're taking your T95 where you need to have it in super low range. Your standard steering or braking is done by use of the levers. There is an accelerator on the right. Well, that leaves you two more pedals in the middle to worry about. And you're with, well, three pedals on the foot, it's brake clutch and accelerate. No, well, hang on a second, you don't need a clutch. It's an automatic, you don't need brakes, you got them here. They are actually brakes, both of them. There's a left brake and a right brake. They're auxiliary brakes. So although ordinarily you do most of your steering and stopping with your tillers, you can, if necessary, add to your steering force by use of, or stopping force, by use of the auxiliary brakes. Now, how much braking do you think a 95-ton vehicle needs when it's going downhill? Well, the manual has an answer for that. You use the accelerator. So what you do is you put this thing on the edge of a crest, and the person would do this as well, but on the edge of a crest, and you're just holding it on the edge with the brakes, you put the vehicle into reverse, you let go of the brakes. The vehicle will now start to roll downhill, and you then use the accelerator to retard your movement because you're, you're accelerating backwards providing basically reverse force to the gravity that's sending you down. Now other controls, uh, one that is not mounted here but he did have one is a driver's compass. So the driver knew at what, uh, at his great speed of eight miles an hour, which way he was going. I mean, you would think if you're gonna get lost, somebody would notice before you got too lost. But you never know, stranger things have happened. His controls to his front are very simple. He's got a tachometer on the right and the most useless speedometer in history on the left. I say useless, not because it isn't a good idea to know if you're doing 8 miles an hour or not, but because the thing goes up to 60. 
Now, I don't think even downhill with a good tailwind, this vehicle will get up to 60 miles an hour. So of the entire arc of this uh, dial, you use maybe about this much of it. So it's kind of like, am I going? Yeah, whatever. Uh, but that's all it took to drive this thing. It's very simple though. No bizarre 15 gears like a, like a heavy truck at the time or anything else like that. Just very simple tillers and, and accelerator. And, and that's it. You set it and go. And that means that now we go from T28. Because there's not many much else to talk about here. It's basically the, the compartment. If you do a pan here, it's basically just a big rectangle with a gun. And things around the outside. That's it. That's your T28 and four sets of tracks on the outside. Of course, by the time the vehicles were delivered, the war was over. Which does raise the question as to just how long the folks in March of 44, when they approved this thing for production, felt it would take for the fighting in France to get to the West Wall. Either way, after the delivery, the vehicle saw service as basically self-propelled weights. If you wanted to test the cargo carrying capacity of a tractor trailer or a railroad flat car or landing ships or whatever, this was the vehicle that you could use to test it. Eventually, one of them supposedly burned in a fire in Yuma, Arizona, and the other somehow went missing in Fort Belvoir, Virginia for 27 years before being found by a hunter. Of course, now what resides is one of the centerpieces of the National Armor and Cavalry Collection in Fort Moore, Georgia. Hope you found it interesting and informative. You won't find many other videos on T28 like this. See you on the next one.